Hello, welcome back. All right, we're going to be talking about westward intensification. We've talked about this a little bit so far. We've talked about western boundary currents. And right now we're going to look at why we have westward intensification. Why do we have those strong western boundary currents? And some of the whys that we'll be exploring include wind forcing and pressure gradient force, friction, and rotation. So things that we're, all, that we're already familiar with. All right. The reading for this is chapter 4, section 4.2.2. Why is there a Gulf Stream? And that is the question that we are going to try to answer. Why is there a Gulf Stream? Why do we have this westward intensification? All right. So to remind us, we can look here again at this surface circulation, which this here is a, just a schematic, a diagram showing us the surface circulation. And we see that, that the Gulf Stream and that in each ocean basin, we have a very strong western boundary current, including the Gulf Stream that we know so well in the North Atlantic Gyre. We also have the Kuroshio in the North Pacific Gyre and the East Australian Current in the South Pacific Gyre, the Brazil Current in the South Atlantic Gyre, and the Agolas Current down in the Indian Ocean Gyre. So all of these are strong Western boundary currents. So we end up with this westward intensification. Another way to think about this is if we look at the sea surface height. So this is showing the average sea surface height in the North Atlantic. And what we see is that there is a, a hill, a high area, a to topographic high in the North Atlantic that is actually not in the center of the Atlantic, but is in fact off to the western side. So we have this topographic high that is also set off to the western side in our gyres, and that is true in both the northern and southern hemispheres. All right, now we've already looked at this schematic before. This is showing us a schematic of the North Atlantic gyre, and we see that the Gulf Stream over here is a very narrow, deep, strong current going northward, and that the return current, the canary current, is a broad, shallow, weak current. And we also see this, this hill that we were just talking about, this topographic hill, and we see that's in fact offset to the west. So that's part of our westward intensification. All right, so why is there westward intensification? Why does this happen? Well, one way that we want to start to think about this is by looking at wind forcing. So to think about wind forcing, we have a very simple schematic showing the dominant winds, which are our westerlies and our trade winds in both hemispheres, our trade winds and our westerlies. So our trade winds are going from east to west and our westerlies go from west to east. And if we use this wind forcing, we can look at this wind forcing and see how that might help us reproduce what we, what we observe, which is as our subtropical gyres that are anticyclonic circulations in both the northern hemisphere, where that would be clockwise, and anticyclonic in the southern hemisphere, where that would be counterclockwise. All right, so the first way to look at this was done by Harold Spedrup. And what he wanted to do was take a very simple idea of wind forcing. So just the idea that we have westerlies, so very simple westerlies going from the west to the east. There's just a very simple zonal flow going from the west to the east in the top part of our North Atlantic gyre. And then in the bottom part, starting at about 30 degrees, um, we have an increasing uh, trade winds that are going from the east to the west. So that's what we're starting with for our wind forcing. Very simple uh, wind forcing. That increase that's very strong at 45 degrees and decreases all the way to um, zero at 30 degrees and then changes direction until we get down to 15 degrees north. All right. So what we want to think about next is 
what that wind forcing will do to the ocean. And so we have to come back to this idea of Ekman transport. Ekman thought about how wind forcing, and if we take our wind forcing, we know the wind, if it's moving in one direction, like this direction right here, now that will pull along the water below it in the same direction due to friction. However, because of Coriolis, the actual direction of motion of the water is going to be offset to the right. And so we end up with our winds, with our, with our waters offset to the right of the motion of the wind forcing. Then each subset, um, layer below that is going to have the, the forcing above it, the frictional pole, in the same direction. However, due to Coriolis, it will also be off to the right slightly, and so on and so forth as we go down, all the way down to our level of no motion. So if we take all of these vectors of the direction of motion that we, we um, got over here, we add these all up. So we're going to take a sum of all of these little vectors. We're going to add them all up and we integrate over this whole column. What we see is that our net flow, that the resultant volume transport is at right angles to the wind. So our net flow is exactly at right angles to the wind, which would be to the right in the northern hemisphere and of course to the left in the southern hemisphere. All right, so taking this idea, let's go back to our wind forcing diagram that Svedrup set up. He set up this wind forcing model. So if our, in the northern part of our North Atlantic gyre, the winds are going from the west to the east, then we turn it, um, if, if Ekman transport says that that will be that the total transport will be to the right, then we would expect that our transport will be southerly. Same thing in the southern part of our North Atlantic gyre. If the winds are going from the east to the west, then um, Ekman transport will say that we should have the water, the actual water will move from um, um, in the northerly direction. So this is, these are the arrows that we would draw if we're looking at, at what the Ekman transport would do. So now imagine the water is being moved towards the center, um, in, from the north towards the center, and also from the south towards the center. And so we can imagine that there's a bunch of water that is piling up here in the center. And so now we've got water piling up. And now we remember that if the water is in fact piling up, that means that we now have a pressure gradient. We have this hill that's now formed. And so if this ball is sitting here on top of our hill, it will roll downhill in either direction away from the center here. And so we see that this is our Ekman transport that's piling up the water in the center. And so we will have a pressure gradient force that's going away from the center. So we now have our pressure gradient force going in opposite directions. And we know that if we have geostrophic flow, that means that if the pressure gradient force is going in one way, then it will be balanced by Coriolis going in the opposite direction. So Coriolis will be turning the water towards the center of our, of our gyre. Now that means that our geostrophic flow because we're in the northern hemisphere, we'll have Coriolis to the right, and in that case, we'll have geostrophic flow moving from west to east in the northern part of our gyre, and we'll have our geostrophic current going from west to, to east, yeah. from west to east in the northern part of our gyre, and from east to west in the southern part of our gyre. So looking at a schematic of what this would look like, we see that we have the Coriolis force going towards the center of our hill, pressure gradient force, of course, going downhill away from the center of our hill. And so our geostrophic flow will go around the hill for our gyre. So that's what the flow would look like, our geostrophic flow around our gyre. So based on that, Spedrup was able to come up with what the depth integrated flow, that would be the total transport due to the idea of Ekman transport that we were talking about, that, that 
um, is going to turn the water towards the center of our gyre and geostrophic flow due to the fact that we end up with that pressure gradient force that's then going to push the water away from our hill. And so he ended up finding, figuring out that we um, can have a depth integrated flow that looks a lot like what we see on the eastern boundary current of our North Atlantic gyre. So one way to look at this is to think about the total amount of water that's being transported meridionally, that's north-south transport. Um, and when we think about that total amount of water that's being transported, what we, we realize is that it's not related just to the direction of the wind, but in fact is proportional to the curl of the wind stress. So we end up looking at the curl of the wind stress. Let's think about what that means again. So if we look at this wind, it's not all the same magnitude. It is all going in the same direction for the top half of our gyre, but it's much stronger at 45 degrees, decreasing all the way to zero at 30 degrees. So what that tells us is that we have a shear. We have a shear. We have a du dy a shear, right? So we saw that was du dy. And that shear is going to give us, is going to give us a curl to our wind stress. So if we remember what that would look like, we see that if we look at what that, that shear will do in terms of rotation and giving us its relative vorticity, we see that that shear will give us our relative vorticity. And so we've got our, our shear here. And we, if we put a paddle wheel in that shear, the paddle wheel won't just be moved from the west to the east, but because it's moving faster in the northern part of the gyre, it will spin, it will start to spin. And that spin will be in this, um, in this, clockwise direction and if we take our right hands and we follow, curl, curl it around, do the curl um, of our rotation, we see that that gives us a negative vorticity. Now I've also put the same diagram inverted down here in the southern part because down here we see that, um, that the um, the magnitude of our velocity is also increasing, is increasing as we get away from the 30 degrees. So as we go down towards 15 degrees, we get this increasing, increasing velocity. And so if we dropped a paddle wheel in here, it wouldn't just move from east to west, but it would have a spin. And that spin would also be in the clockwise direction. So we end up with this clockwise direction, which gives us, again, if we do our right hand rule, a negative vorticity. Now, that's telling us, if we look at, at, at this actual transport here, we see that the, the most transport, the, it moves the most from north to south. It moves the most at the point where it's, the, the wind is actually changing the most, which happens right at 30 degrees, where it changes direction entirely. So right there, it changes direction, and that's where we see that, that we have the most transport. So we see that the meridional transport is actually proportional to the curl of our wind stress. So that's what this is right here. This is the meridional transport. The meridional transport, which is the total amount of water being transported meridionally, that's the north-south direction. And that is gonna be equal to a constant times the curl of our wind stress. This is our wind stress here, this tau. And that constant is also important. That constant is one over beta, where beta is the rate of change of F. And we remember F fondly, F is our Coriolis parameter. That is zero at the equator and it is greatest at the poles. All right, so. That's what Svedrup was able to see. And if we look at, at what was going on there, we see that there is this 
this is a schematic again, the white lines are showing us the, um, the symmetric wind field that overlies the North Atlantic gyre. And the blue lines show us that even though there's this, this symmetric wind field, the gyre itself, the flow in the gyre itself is asymmetric. And so we see that the lines are all smushed together over here, where we have this really strong, fast-moving western boundary current. And they're broader over here, where we have this slow eastern boundary current. And the center is actually offset to the west. So Svedrick's theoretical flow field gave us this eastern uh, boundary current. However, it couldn't give us this western boundary current. It couldn't give us our Gulf Stream. So we need to look at something else in order to get that western boundary current.